Reviewing this new M4 Pro MacBook Pro should be relatively easy. Apple have nailed these laptops since they switched to Apple Silicon and we know the hardware is good, the chips are fast and the battery life is really decent. But in this M4 model, there's actually loads of new things here. Most of it is good, but there is still one area where it falls on its face. For some context, my daily driver is actually the M1 Pro MacBook Pro, the base model from 2021. So in this video, I'm going to see if it's going to be worth upgrading to this new M4 one. And if you're new here, do consider subscribing to the channel. I'm trying to hit 200K before the year is out and I'm really close to it. Anyway, let's get started with one of the first new things, which is the new screen. So one of the big things this year was the new screen of the Nano Texture Display, which is supposed to kind of get rid of all reflections on the screen. So I've come to a local cafe, which is pretty much made of Windows. So I'm going to give it a proper try out here. I also brought my old MacBook Pro so you can see the difference. I've also picked the most reflective place in the entire cafe to sit. So hopefully it should be a good test. Okay, so the difference you can tell pretty much immediately. The new MacBook Pro with the Nano Texture Display is way less reflective and it's not distracting at all to work on. I can imagine if you kind of did a lot of work on the move or in cafes like I am now or on the train or something like that, it's going to be really, really useful. And when I compare it to my old MacBook Pro, it's so much more reflective. As good as this is, there are trade-offs when it comes to it. If you pick this nano texture option, the colors are going to look a little bit washed out and the blacks aren't quite as deep. And I'm not sure how good that would be if you do the kind of like color specific work or anything like that. So for me, I would rather stick with the glossy display and keep those kind of nice saturated colors and then funnel the extra money this costs into something like RAM or into storage or something like that. I'm a very rare traveler though. I don't really go out too much and I don't work outside and I'm rarely in a position where big reflections make a difference. But if it does to you, then this nano texture display really does work. Talking of things which just work, and I can't believe I'm about to say this, it's the perfect segue to my sponsor. LTT Store. This is their off-site laptop bag and it's a really nice middle ground between a sleeve and a messenger bag, giving you a huge amount of storage and protection while remaining nice and compact. One of its best features is the fact that it folds flat so you have immediate access to all the things you need rather than awkwardly rooting around. There's pockets galore in here too with spaces for pretty much anything. There's elastic straps for tying wires down and there's even a hidden place for an air tag which is a wonderfully thoughtful addition. Oh and there's a little place for your tablet too. The main laptop section is lined with micro suede to protect your device and on this smaller model you can fit most laptops between 13 and 14 inches but there's a larger version available too for 16 to 17 inch beasts. For carrying there's a handle a detachable shoulder strap and a removable luggage strap so you can carry this in any way that suits you best. This is a really nicely put together bag. The quality is completely on point. You're getting YKK zippers all over and that interior lining with the micro suede is just really nice. So if you want to check this out at all, I'll leave the link in the description and a huge thank you goes out to LTT Store for sponsoring this video. Okay, now we're back at the studio. I did want to talk about some benchmark stuff. And look, I don't put a huge amount of salt into benchmarks, but I've only done some ones which I think are genuinely worth looking at. I'm going to re-export my last YouTube video, which was 10 minutes and 30 seconds. I'm going to export 200 raw files from Lightroom into a folder. And I'm also going to do some AI workloads with the new magnetic mask in Final Cut. So I've got all of the Macs out. I'm going to run it all at the same time. I'm gonna see how it goes. For context, this new M4 Pro is the M4 Pro chip. It's got 14 CPU cores, it's got 20 GPU cores, and it's got 48 gigabytes of RAM as well. Let's start with the video render. This is in Final Cut, and on my Mac Studio, which is the M1 Max model, this exported in five minutes and 47 seconds. The M1 Pro base model, which is my standard laptop, was 10 minutes and 10 seconds, and the brand new M4 MacBook Pro was nine minutes and 11 seconds. So on these results, I actually thought the M4 Pro would pull a little further ahead than my standard MacBook Pro, but it just goes to show how much further ahead the Max chips are, even though this is a few generations old. Next up is the Lightroom export of 200 raw photos into high quality JPEGs. Starting again with the M1 Max Mac Studio, which did it in two minutes and 41 seconds. The M1 Pro MacBook Pro did it in three minutes and 52 seconds. And the M4 Pro MacBook Pro did it in a measly one minute, 27 seconds, which is substantially faster. That was kind of more what I was expecting to see with this kind of jump in generation. So that was nice. The last workload I'm doing is an AI focused one. And for this, I'm using Final Cut and the magnetic mask feature. This effectively cuts around a subject and lets you edit it separately or remove the background or anything like that. And I'm doing this on a one minute and 10 second clip of me talking. 
amazing. The M1 Max Max Studio managed to do it in two minutes, 20 seconds. The M1 Pro MacBook Pro managed to do it in two minutes and 29 seconds. And the M4 Pro MacBook Pro managed it in one minute, 27 seconds, which again felt more in line with what Apple were promising in terms of updates. And that does seem to track the AI workload of the M4 chip is supposed to be really good. And that clearly showed it off here. Some pretty interesting results there. I genuinely thought that the M4 Pro would absolutely smash the M1 Pro when it came to the video export, but it wasn't actually too different at all. It's just when it came to the CPU and AI workloads that it tends to really pull ahead of the other two. It also reconfirms to me that if graphics and exporting big multi-threaded things is your bag, then the Max versions of these Macs are still the way to go. My M1 Max Mac Studio is still absolutely killing the video export, which is the main deal for me. And that kind of rolls me around to performance in general. For everyday stuff, the M4 is certainly a beat quicker than my M1 variants for pretty much everything when it comes to standard computing use. So opening up apps and switching between them and just using them in general does feel a hair quicker, but I don't think it's game changing in any way. It does go to show though, as more AI stuff creeps into everything that we do, that this M4 chip is going to be a lot better at handling that than these M1s. But for right now, it's not a huge difference. Before we talk about what the Mac isn't actually very good at, let's talk about some of those small differences as well. Now this year brings a new space black color, which is really nice. It's probably the darkest version of black that Apple have ever made. Um, it's not for me, I prefer the kind of silver look, but for people that are looking for it, that's really nice. The webcam now has center stage, so it will follow you around, which is a nice update. It also looks a bit better and it gives you desk view, which is this really interesting kind of little addition, which lets you show what's on your desk without needing another camera. Camera. It basically bends around what the camera is seeing so you can show something off that's on your desk. If you've got a little bit of paper or a drawing or something like that, you don't need an extra camera to show it. And the ports are now up to Thunderbolt 5, which means you're going to get faster transfers for SSDs or anything like that, which is all really nice. Okay, let's talk about the one area where the MacBook still pretty much falls on its face despite having the specs to back it up, and that's in gaming. And gaming on Mac on the surface seems okay. If you open up Steam, there's thousands of games on there, and if you open up the Mac App Store, there's even more thousands on there, although nobody wants to buy a game on the App Store, let's face it. But the issue is, it's missing the heavy hitters. There's no Call of Duty on Mac, there's no Fortnite, there's no Valorant, there's no Diablo 4, just to name a few, and games really do make the experience. If the games aren't here on Mac, then people aren't gonna go to it to play them. The other issue with gaming on a Mac as well is the ecosystem around it. You can't upgrade anything on a Mac, so if you needed more RAM for a certain game, then there's nothing you can do about it. Or if you wanted to build a huge driving simulator, you can do that on PC, but you know, I bet that's not gonna run well on Mac, if at all. So that's another barrier in itself. I actually have so many thoughts about this, I could probably do an entire video on it. So if you wanna see that, let me know in the comments below. However, all of that aside, I did run some games on here to test it. First up was Hades 2, which ran at a beautiful 100 FPS and higher, pretty much across the entire thing, even when the firefights got pretty big. But then I did up the ante by running Baldur's Gate 3 as well. And that defaults to ultra and high settings too, which was really nice to see but the frame rate pretty much stayed locked at 30 to 35 FPS, which on that game isn't so bad. And if you jump the settings down a little bit to kind of medium and low, then I managed to get it closer to 60 FPS. But those are pretty much the only games I have access to right now on the Mac. So yeah, the Mac still isn't perfect for gaming, but I do think there's a bright future there for it. It's just not quite here yet. So with all of that aside, is this gonna be a worthwhile upgrade for my M1 Pro, MacBook Pro? And I'm gonna give you the real simple and basic answer. Probably not. Even though this M4 one is the first one since the M1 that I've genuinely been tempted by, I still don't feel like I'm at the limit with this M1 Pro MacBook Pro, and I'm especially not at the limit with my M1 Max Mac Studio. There's some clear places where it is completely better with the AI workloads, and as that goes forward, then you know clearly the M4 is gonna be the one to go for, but I don't use much AI stuff at the moment. So for another year at least, I'm gonna stick with my M1 stuff. The only thing it has got me thinking about though is to get rid of my M1 Pro MacBook Pro and my Mac Studio and to consolidate both of those into an M4 Max MacBook Pro and then just have one computer rather than two floating around. But I'd like to know what you think about that. Do you have two or do you just have one computer? Anyway, that pretty much wraps up this review of the M4 MacBook Pro. I really love this laptop. Apple have done a fantastic job. I just don't need the upgrade quite yet. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, pop a like. If you're picking up one of these or if you've got one or if you've got any thoughts about it, leave it in the comments below because you know I love to read and see those things and I will see you all in the next one.